Thanks everybody for um, joining us in this new uh, webinar. Um, as you know, please, uh, during the presentations uh, and before the uh, questions uh, time, uh, try to keep your microphone and camera off, okay? And then uh, in question time, uh, please, uh, you can use your chat or you can raise your hand in the Teams interface and I will uh, try to uh, give everybody a chance to ask uh, uh, questions. So today uh, we are very uh, pleased to uh, introduce uh, Esmeralda uh, Muresan. Uh, Esmeralda Muresan uh, is going to be giving today uh, today's webinar. Uh, previous edition, as, as you know, some of you, we had Emily Bender and Henji. And then just to remind you that uh, in May the 2nd, next month, we are going to have Russ Slaughter and then in June, Marco Baroni. So you also uh, uh, obviously, uh, very welcome to join us for these editions. But uh, today, uh, like I said, we, I'm very, very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Esmeralda uh, Muresan. Uh, I've been following her work uh, for a long time, especially on figurative language, but also on fact checking, uh, both in terms of uh, discriminative and uh, generative approaches. She's a research scientist at the Data Science Institute uh, at Columbia uh, University. She's also an Amazon scholar. She's been, uh, she's very well known, uh, obviously, uh, in the NLP field in general, and in particular in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the her work on theory guided and knowledge aware computational models for understanding and generating language in context with um, many applications and many publications and some paper, best paper awards on uh, research on trying to understand uh, figurative language such as sarcasm, metaphor and idioms and also on trying to, uh, uh, sorry, uh, to uh, apply generative approaches for uh, those kind of uh, figurative uh, language phenomena. Uh, she's also been working in interesting multilanguage, uh, multilingual uh, language processing and applications to try to address the uh, issues or the lack of uh, data for low resource languages, which is obviously very interesting for us here in the Basque Country. And quite recently, she's been working a lot on trying to uh, generate uh, data sets synthetically using large language models and also uh, working on explainability. So uh, she's got a very, if I invite you to check her website and her publications and you'll find they are quite uh, uh, interesting. So today she's going to be talking about human-centric natural language processing from argumentation to creativity. And so without further ado, uh, the metaphorical floor uh, is yours. So I will now stop sharing my screen. And um, you can send you. yours and um, please. Thank you so much uh, for the great introduction. And I am uh, very happy to be here um, to talk about the work we are doing in human centric uh, natural language processing. And today I'm going to focus on some of the area in argumentation and creativity. Uh, so before I start, can everyone uh, see my screen? Is it? Yes, perfect. Okay, great, perfect. Um, so, argumentation and creativity, uh, we find them uh, helpful in many areas. Um, and developing tools around this uh, argumentation and creativity can help, for example, improving education and learning, like improving students' uh, both critical thinking and also their writing skills in terms of argumentation and argumentative skills, as well as creative skills. Uh, we can see them also having impact in journalism, like storytelling or fact checking false or misleading content. Uh, if you're looking, for example, in science communication, how to explain complex concepts using, for example, analogies or metaphors or present evidence based scientific ideas that support um, particular claims. And last but not least, for example, in advertising, designing visual metaphors or writing persuasive messages. Um, of course, we need to address uh, kind of the elephant in the room. We are in the era of large language models and generative AI, 
And we see that not only into the research side, but also these tools are becoming available to real people using them. And this was an article in the New York Times, 35 ways real people are using AI right now. And one I picked up here on the right is like getting feedback on their writing skills and fictions. Um, and these seem, well, language models seem very, very um, good in terms of like, you know, fluent text, uh, sometimes also exhibit reasoning capabilities. And here is an example I took from Yejin's Choice keynote at ACL. Um, if you travel far, uh, west far enough from the west coast, you will reach the east coast um, and the model responds, the world is round, so you will reach the east coast, therefore the answer is true. However, we see a lot of cases where this reasoning fails, and more most of the times um, they uh, they show um, a failing in reasoning about common sense. So this is an example um, from a TED Talk from uh, Yejin's, like a user asked, "Would I get a flat tire by bicycling over a bridge that is suspended over nails, screws, and broken glass?" And here the model fails to assess uh, spatial reasoning and with response, it is highly likely that you will get a flat tire um, over uh, if you bicycle off over a bridge um, that is suspended over nails. We also see other failures in terms of uh, reasoning about common sense. Um, this is an example like Mabel heart rate at 9 a.m. was 75 and her blood pressure at 7 p.m. was 120 over 80s. She dies at 11 p.m. Was she alive at noon? And here the model fails to, to uh, assess time uh, reasoning. And based on the information provided, we cannot have enough data to determine whether Maibel was alive at noon. And we also see, for example, if we prompt now models uh, to generate uh, creative text and visual metaphors, in this case, il illustrate a visual metaphor for freedom of speech. And um, we see that it's not super felicitous. Um, rendering of this uh, metaphoric concept. So, um, so here are some of the challenges that I see in the NLP and AI uh, fields, uh, particularly in this era of large language models. So one, of course, is reasoning and reasoning about the world in general. Uh, the other one is the lack of high quality data sets um, to build, both to build and evaluate much smaller models rather than these very, very large uh, closed language models. And particularly to have these data sets around user relevant tasks. And the third challenge that I see is evaluation protocols, particularly for long form generation that are used both to judge the quality of the model output, but also the quality of the model as evaluators. Uh, we see a lot of work right now, for example, using uh, GPT-4 to evaluate the output of other models, right? So instead of using human judgments, we are actually using now this model as evaluators. So um, we want to have this evaluation protocol to, to assess whether they are actually good or, good or not. So to address this, these challenges, um, I propose some solutions. Um, so for the first challenge, um, we are working on uh, developing uh, knowledge enhanced models, combining the power of large language models with the powers of knowledge, uh, for example, common sense or linguistic knowledge, as well as theoretical insights to solve the problem. And, um, and particularly in the area of creativity and argumentation, we have been looking, for example, of generating figurative language like sarcasm or metaphors or similes. In argumentation, we have been looking, for example, at argument reframing, how to take an argument that contains, for example, a fallacy and making it more trustworthy or anti-meme reconstructions. And this is the task of understanding on, of, on implicit um, argument um, and also fallacy recognitions. Uh, to address the second challenge, um, we are developing human AI collaboration frameworks, um, and these are important uh, areas, for example, to address several issues. One is to generate high quality data sets. And here we have been looking in a lot of areas uh, for this um, figurative language understanding, for example, or visual metaphors. Um, also, this human AI collaboration um, is fruitful, al almost like a feedback loop to then help improve the model, uh, for example, in faithful image editing. And last but not least, of how can you use this human AI collaboration to help humans solve tasks, for example, co-creative writing. 
And to address the last problem, we have been looking at developing evaluation protocols, um, and we focused um, recently on developing rubrics to evaluate creative writing and trying to answer some questions like, are language models good at generative creative stories? Are they good as evaluators for creative stories? And how do experts use language models for creative writing? So today I want to cover um, some uh, nuggets of research from each of these um, areas. And this, I would see it almost like a human-centric NLP framework um, that we are working under. So I'm going to highlight um, several of that uh, just kind of um, very briefly. So in the first uh, part, I want to um, focus on the work we did in argumentation on anti-mean by construction. Then from the second trust, we're going to look at some uh, work on generating data sets for visual metaphors, as well as help, uh, showing how humans are using these language models for co-creative writing. And then I, I will uh, present some very, very recent work on proposing some evaluation protocols to um, for evaluating creative writing. So I start first with the anti-meme reconstruction, and this is a key problem in argument mining. This is a work uh, now quite old in 2021. Um, and uh, the task, uh, the anti-meme, just to give the definition, is an incomplete argument found in discourse uh, where some components are explicit, but other propositions are left implicit and need to be filled in as premises or conclusion to fully understand the argument. So anti-meme reconstruction is basically recovering these implicit premises, for example. So this is an example from uh, Sherlock Holt, uh, Silver Blaze case. A dog was kept in stable, and yet, though someone had been in and fetched out a horse, he had not barked enough to rouse the two lads in the lock. Obviously, the midnight visitor was someone whom the dog knew well. So here's the missing premise is the dogs generally bark when a person enters an area unless the dogs know the person well. So um, at that point, um, we it was very little work in anti-meme reconstruction. So um, we framed the task as a generation task. So given an anti-meme consisting of a stating conclusion and a stating premise, the task is to generate this implicit missing premise and we approach this problem as a text-to-text -text generation task. But there are several key challenges um, to go about solving the problem. One is the lack of large-scale training data to train this text-to-text -text model. So at that point, uh, we had very, very little data, for example, only in the uh, amount of uh, hundreds, and we're going to use those data sets to evaluate, but we, we didn't have any data to train the model. Um, and of course, in this area of argument, implicit arguments, we really need models that are able to uh, reason about common sense. So I mentioned that uh, most of the work we've been doing in all these areas are trying to look at theoretical insights when we approach solving a problem. And for this particular case, we look at argumentation theories, which states that Incomplete arguments in naturally occurring discourse more often than not require abductive reasoning, which is plausible explanation rather than the more strict form of reasoning based on deductive logic. So with this in mind, um, our approach to solve this problem of anti-meme reconstruction, as I mentioned, was a text-to-text -text generation problem. And here we just used, uh, at that point, um, a text-to-text sequence-to-sequence -text, uh, -sequence model, BART, and uh, where you have as input the incomplete argument, uh, and I'm giving here an example, vaccination save lives, and vaccination should be mandatory for children, and you give this input, and the output should be the implicit premise. And we can see that if we just take off the shelf these tools, they are not really generating any plausible um, uh, premises here. It's vaccination save lives, they save money, which either repeats or add uh, no, uh, nonsense. Um, uh, information. So the question was how to address the two key challenges that I mentioned, the lack of training data. And for this, we leverage abductive reasoning as an auxiliary task. So here we use this theoretical insight that I mentioned from argumentation theory. Um, and then for addressing the second challenge of the need of the common sense knowledge, here we use the combination of large language models and knowledge models. And I'm going to just describe briefly uh, what it is to uh, to be able to to solve uh, 
the task. So let me first go and introduce a bit the problem of abductive reasoning. Um, and we took advantage at that point of a data set that was developed at University of Washington, abductive reasoning in narrative text. Um, and what they did, uh, this was a data set was developed using crowdsourcing. So given two observation, uh, O1 and O2, uh, the task is to generate the most plausible and implausible hypothesis that explain this observation. So the way they constructed the data set, they look at the rock stories, which are very short stories, and they took the first and the last sentence. So in this case, Amy was looking through her mother's old scrapbooks. And the observation two is Amy realized her mother had dated her history professor. And the hypothesis the, that was um, generated by crowdsources was Amy found pictures of her history professor and mother together. And with this, they built um, uh, 50,000 instances of training data in this type of uh, abductive reasoning. So with this, uh, what we can do, we can just use this data set to fine tune this sequence to sequence model. So as input, we're going to use these two observations using the, with a separator. So Amy was looking through her mother's old scrapbook and Amy realized her mother had dated her history professor as input. And as output is basically these two observation, but also including the hypothesis, which was the um, what is the plausible explanation. So. In here we add, and since Amy found picture of her history professor and mother together between uh, the two observations. So with this, we fine tune the BART model, uh, very simple. And now if we look at our original example that we give at inference time, we can now give two, um, uh, a conclusion and a premise, and we want to generate the implicit premise. So in this case, we can see that what is generated as an implicit premise, it's more plausible than before. Vaccination are the best way to protect children. Uh, but can we do better? Um, and here what we did, we, we thought about using discourse aware common sense knowledge because we are having two, uh, two sentences. So we want to take uh, into account both uh, sentences when we are generating the common sense knowledge. And for this, we use Paracomet, which is a discourse aware knowledge model that incorporates paragraph level information to generate a coherent common sense inferences from narratives. So just in case uh, people are not familiar with knowledge model, I'm just going to give a very quick idea uh, what it is. So we all know that pre-trained language model do have some knowledge about um, some implicit um, representation of knowledge. Um, well, here the idea was that we want to retrain them on knowledge graph to learn the structure of knowledge. And this knowledge graph shown here, like the seed knowledge graph training, we can get information either from concept nets, so you know that encodes some sort of taxonomic relation, like for example, mango is used for salsa, or we can use any other knowledge base. And this, in this case, atomic uh, that was developed as an event database. Uh, and this is an example: if a person gets a, um, his car, her, her car repair, uh, because X one it and then you have the, the implication to maintain the car, right? So then what you do, you actually train and continue training these large language models on these knowledge graphs to build this uh, common sense transformer comment and this this resulting knowledge model generalizing structure to other concepts. So this was the main idea. So uh, what we use, we took this comment, um, but then uh, the extension of this model uh, to generate discourse aware common sense knowledge. So let's look here what it means to take into account the discourse and what's the difference. So if we look at the sentence, Ella walked around the property just in isolation, and we want to see what is the common sense knowledge, for example, what was her intention. If we just look at this sentence, you might want to generate something like, well, she walked because she wanted to get exercise. However, if we look at the previous sentence in the discourse, the water bill at Ella's house had been high, then more likely her intention was not to get exercise, but to find the leak or to fix the pipes, right? So this is, was the idea of enhancing these knowledge models with discourse information. So what we did, we used this um, directly. We use as input. Uh, our discourse was these two uh, sentences together, uh, observation one and observation two, and we use para, uh, para comment to gen generate the common sense knowledge um, from that. So in this case, 
um, the output of Paracomet was uh, Amy was looking through her mother's old scrapbook to find something. So this was the knowledge edit. And Amy realized the mother had dated her history professor. So now we use this as input um, and then uh, use the same as, as output as before. And we fine tune now BART model on this, uh, on this data. So we can see now that if we use this at inference time, um, we take the example we have vaccination save life. Um, and then again, we use these two of the uh, inputs um, to uh, Paracomet. And here we add the common sense knowledge that was uh, derived to stop diseases. And now the output looks uh, much more plausible. Vaccination are the best way to prevent childhood disease. So this was the main idea. And then for to test at that point, we only had uh, three data sets for anti-memes. Uh, one was the argument reasoning comprehension task by Habernal et al. Uh, that contains 1,600 anti-memes. And then two other smaller data sets of 500 and 112 anti-memes. Well, all with human generated implicit premises. Uh, so we generated the models. Um, we generate BART. Uh, we look at BART at zero shot. So basically just applying the, the pre-trained BART. We, uh, we also tested the model only fine tune on the auxiliary uh, task of uh, abductive reasoning. And this is AR. And then we also add the one when we, uh, where we fine tune it on the Paracomet uh, output, so ARK. Um, so here we did both uh, automatic and human evaluation. So the automatic evaluation, we use BERT score and we compare the output of the model with the reference. And, but also we look at the human evaluation where we try to compare um, the performance of the model that use common sense knowledge and the model that does not use common sense knowledge only uses the auxiliary task. And we see that also adding this uh, extra um, knowledge from Paracomet improved the model output, both in terms of automatic metrics um, and in terms of human judgment on plausibility. But we also see that we are still far away from uh, really um, solving the task um, in this case. So the takeaways from this approach, and we have been using these ideas across many different tasks, um, is, um, is very important to look at theoretical insights about the phenomena because that gives you some um, way of thinking, designing, and solving the problem. So in this case, we actually use the theoretical insights of connection between implicit arguments and abductive reasoning. Um, we look at combining large language models with knowledge models to better plan content and add control to generation systems. And also um, evaluation metrics and methods are important. And especially for generation tasks is important not only to look at automatic metrics, but also look at designing evaluation uh, based on human judgments um, and criteria for that. Um, so now I want to uh, go on on the second uh, approach and the second um, trust of research of do, looking at this human AI collaboration frameworks. And I'm going to talk about two um, related um, kind of research areas. Well, it's one is how to build data sets and good quality data sets for generating visual metaphors, and then how to use human feedback on this um, to build better models and then to further improve the, the data set. So I'm going to talk about these two um, shortly, these two um, approaches. So first, uh, what is visual metaphor, right? So that's a powerful rhetorical device uh, used to persuade or communicate creative ideas through images. They convey meaning implicitly through symbolism and just opposition of symbols. So if we look at the left, um, and I, I will want people actually here to say, so maybe you can open your mics. So what do you see the first image will be a representation? What is the, the metaphor for? Anyone who wants to say what they think? Uh, free of speech? Yes, exactly. So that's the freedom of speech. Um, and then the, one, the other one that I really like, this was the New Yorker article um, last year um, and showing these two hands. And this is a metaphor of a human AI collaboration where we don't quite know who is drawing, which hand is drawing what hand, right? So is the human who is drawing the um, the machine or the machine is drawing the human. 
Um, so the task um, we uh, were looking at, and this is, was on a paper um, we had at uh, findings of ACL, we want to look at the task of generating visual metaphors from linguistic metaphors. So for example, you have the, uh, the linguistic metaphor, he was a lion in the battlefield, and we want to generate a, a visual metaphor for that. But what are the challenges here is that it requires implicit meaning, um, and as well as merging of objects, properties, and relations that are involved, right? So these are well-known uh, challenges in text-to-image models, um, like underspecification and attribute object binding. So again, as this is um, this is the work that we did on generating visual metaphor. As I mentioned, I spy a metaphor. This was the paper at findings of ACL. So what we did, okay. So first we said let's start with um, just using this text to image uh, generative models like DALI. And here is an example of a uh, linguistic metaphor. My bedroom is a pigsty. And then if you just use this dolly, and this was dolly in 2000, at like the end of 2022, um, and you can see that it really doesn't understand the meaning of the metaphor. It just generates a big bedroom with some pig, uh, uh, with a pig lying around there. Like, um, um, so what we said, well, can we leverage this power of like um, language models uh, and chain of thought prompting to elaborate a visual description of what is actually the meaning of the linguistic metaphor. So we use this uh, language model at that point, uh, Instruct GPT-3, um, where we use chain of thought prompting to, uh, uh, to generate this uh, visual elaboration, a bedroom with clothes and garbage everywhere with a pig in the center rooting. Um, and then we give this as input to, um, to Dolly, right? Um, and then we see that actually are getting a much a better uh, rendering of the visual metaphors that has the implicit meaning of uh, being dirty. So here in this paper, we have this novel approach where we look at collaboration between large language model and vision model to generate um, visual metaphors. And then uh, the outcome was HiveMet, which is human AI um, collaboration visual metaphor data set, which is a high quality visual metaphor data set of 6,000 um, examples, which is built through a human AI collaboration uh, framework. So let me briefly uh, go into how we, we, we did that. So the first stage, uh, as I mentioned, was to take the linguistic metaphors and generate this visual elaboration to chain of thought uh, prompting. So in this case, we did uh, several examples. We have the instructions, and then we give a few short examples for uh, five, I think, five examples. Um, and these were uh, written by human. These were demonstrations. So in this example, the metaphor is my lawyer is a shark. The objects to be included, the lawyer and the shark, the implicit meaning is fierce, and the visual elaboration, a shark in a suit with fierce eyes and a suitcase and the mouth open with pointed teeth. So we give these five examples, and then giving a new metaphor, my bedroom is a pigsty, the model then will generate the objects to be included. So we made it a structured, a messy bedroom and pig, the implicit meaning dirty, and then the visual elaboration, which is a bedroom with clothes and garbage everywhere with the big center rooting around, right? So that's how we, we end up generating these visual elaborations. Um, but then uh, the question was, is the model always correct? So this is example um, for a new metaphor. The news uh, of the accident was a dagger in her heart. Uh, the elaboration we get from the language model was a heart with a dagger stuck into it, dripping with blood and paint in the woman's eyes. So it's kind of, well, it gets this um, idea. However, there is a missing piece of um, information from the original um, um, metaphor, which is the news of the accident. So what we do here, we are having a human in the loop, which is looking at the output of the large language models and makes small edits to be able to make sure that the visual elaboration is faithful to the input. So in this case, it adds this extra information, a woman receiving a phone call um, and her heart with the dagger stuck to it, dripping blood and so on. So then we use these uh, minor expert edits um, in the visual elaboration, then as input to DALI to generate a better uh, metaphor. And then we use a second stage of human um, uh, feedback in terms of selecting 
um, the, the metaphors and the images that are much better. So we select in the end, we generate in many alternative uh, metaphors and select the, the, the best ones. Um, so then we evaluated this, uh, both the human, the language models um, and the text to image models collaboration, as well as the quality of, of our data set. And for this, we actually use expert feedback, we use expert designer and illustrators, and they were judging images to provide um, if they are uh, good or not, and also provide instructions that are needed to make the image better unless the image is perfect or lost cause. So these are some examples. So if we look at the image in the right from its blue vase, the rose of evening drops, um, the, the expert feedback was here, change the background to the sunset colors, right? So it's kind of a given instruction to, to make the image better in case it was not perfect. So now we, on evaluation, we did several evaluation. I'm going to highlight only some here. Um, we asked these concept illustrators to perform evaluation by ranking the outputs of 100 random linguistic metaphor and suggest edits unless perfect and lost cause. And uh, they also look at ranking the system. So here I want to compare, if you look at the two boxes, like here the, we compare stable diffusion um, when also stable diffusion in combination with the large language models. So, so where we have this visual elaboration and then also DALI and DALI with the large language model. So in both cases, we can see that ha having this language model and um, text to image model collaboration uh, improve the performance and lower is banker because here is the rank of the system. And similarly, when we look at the percent of images that are lost causes, uh, we have, um, especially when we look at Dolly, uh, the percentage of the images with lost uh, cause, it's, I think it's going to end up around 5%. And then if we add the human feedback on top of it, uh, we, we only have about 1% of the data with, um, that are really bad uh, generations. Um, then we also did an extrusive evaluation looking at this data set uh, to test performance of the model on visual entailment tasks. So in this case, what we have, we have the, the visual metaphors and the image, and then we have a caption that, for example, say, does the image imply the snow made the earth look exposed and vulnerable? And here is a contradiction. Um, and then in the first, in the second image, uh, does the image imply her bones are chilled by the cold? And this is an entailment, right? So you have an image and claim pairs um, that refers to the same thing or not. And for this, what we did is basically um, with models, uh, we, we showed the performance of the model train on an existing visual entailment data set, was not on the visual metaphor. Um, and this was the SNLI, which is the National Language Entailment Visual um, visual entailment metaphors, um, and then looking at a model train on this data set together with our model, and we can see now that the model um, is actually uh, getting better when we are fine tuned on our um, on our data set. So just a short advertising uh, here. It's a new shared task uh, that we have at the figurative language workshop that we work more on um, looking at understanding figurative language through visual entailment. So here, in addition to having the image and the, the caption uh, and uh, trying to understand the contradiction, we also generated explanations. So the task will be not only to predict whether there is a contradiction or an internal, but also to explain why. So if you're interested in this field, uh, please um, uh, submit to this shared task. The, the deadline is uh, March uh, 17, so there are still uh, 10 days um, for that. So now we want to look at um, as we mentioned before, uh, we actually get data from the humans uh, and this instruction how to make the model better. Um, and here was the original metaphor, my heart is a garden tired with autumns. And this was the original from our data set, but then the, the, uh, the, the illustrative designer were mentioning change the heart such that it makes up of autumn leaves. So now if we take this, um, edit instruction and use an off-the-shelf tool that instruct pixel to pixel with the state-of-the-art uh, image editing tool, we see that it doesn't really do a faithful uh, edit. Uh, it does add autumns, but then it also changes the background. So the problem that we have right now is that these um, image editing um, tools are not faithful. And this is a big problem. 
Uh, and these are some of the existing issues in this language-based image editing, which is under the specification, the grounding, which is the problem of localizing where to edit, and the faithfulness, which is a big problem, which means to preserve the elements of the image which are not affected by the edit. So here, for example, if you look into the image of the left and the instruction is at the lighthouse, you can see that the image on the right is not only edit one lighthouse, it edits three, but also it deletes uh, the, the houses from the original image, so it's really not faithful. So one of the issue that it is in this uh, in, in this uh, uh, tools that exist right now, especially in the instruct picture to pics, is that they are really built on very noisy training data. So this data set was semi-automatically created um, using input image instruction and output image tuples. Um, and here is, for example, it's an example from the training date, replace her with a bird. So it takes the image on the left and instead of replacing the woman with a bird, it just adds a bird on her hand, right? So this is very noisy. And because of that, if you really fine tune your models on this noisy data, of course, you're going to get noisy and unfaithful uh, models. So what we did was we actually did uh, work on learning to follow object centric edits. And this was a paper at uh, findings of EMNLP. So we, our main Kind of contribution here is kind of having an approach to clean this noisy training data. So here we start with the caption Buttermere Lake District and you have an image and you have an instruction and an Aurora Borealis and we use this chain of thought prompting with the models to try to understand whether the edit is even possible and to also identify and localize what are the entities that needs to be affected. So here uh, you want to add an Aurora Borealis, you then here the, the implicit um, uh, part of the instruction is that you will need to localize and understand that this Aurora Borealis needs to be in the sky. Uh, then taken this image and these entities, we detect this object in the image, then we apply an image segmentation uh, where we localize that and giving now this, um, this uh, segmented um, image, we want to generate uh, an, uh, alternative images. So you use here stable diffusion in painting with the instruction Buttermere Lake District with Aurora Borealis. So we, here we generate uh, several. So we, we sample to generate three alternatives um, images. And then to figure out which one is the best, um, we use a visual question answering task. So what we do, we uh, generate questions uh, relevant to the image and to the, to the instructions. And then we ask, is there a lake district in the painting or does the image contain an Aurora Borealis? And then through visual question answering, we select the image that uh, is accurate. So with this, we remove actually 90% of the data for training of instruct picks to peels. Um, and then we're going to show that actually using this much, much smaller data set, which still has enough uh, data like 50K um, examples, uh, leads to better quality. In addition to that, uh, we did a very small change um, when we train and we fine tune again the uh, the model in Instruct Picks to Picks uh, is to find an edit entity and using a language model and mask that area. So here, for example, if I have make the skirt red, we identify the entity that needs to be changed and we mask it and then we um, we fine tune that that way. So what we notice here, we benchmark this data both on in-domain, so the in-domain of the Instruct Picks to Picks uh, data set, but also the out-of-domain, which was our visual metaphors. And we use both uh, automatic metrics like the uh, text image faithfulness uh, scores as well as human evaluations. And what I want to emphasize here, the last row is our um, model fine tune on the clean data and with the entity mask. And then if we compare with the instruct picks to picks, particularly uh, is interesting to look at the out of domain we actually have a very big jump um, in performance from 25 on the human score to 65. So having better clean data um, is really definitely helpful. So then we can actually improve better the model. So here is going back. Uh, our original imperf uh, imperfect metaphor uh, was improved by using this uh, new uh, editing model. So, but if we look, so our model is on the right. So now we see that it's a better uh, visual metaphor. But now let's say if we try, as I mentioned, the instructing to piece was not doing the right edit. And if we look at GPT-4, it's also uh, not doing faithful um, edits. 
So here the takeaways are um, we want high quality data leads to better models and the human feedback and better models again help us to improve the data. So this is a feedback loop between the humans and the AI uh, collaborations. So now for the last part, I want to focus on using um, human, uh, using AI to help humans solve tasks. And I'm going to focus on creative uh, writing and uh, also trying to answer in the first part, how do experts use language models for creative writing? So we did develop this collaborative framework for creativity support, and this is a paper that is under submission right now, um, and creativity and cognition. And we, are, we did an empirical study involving emerging writers. So what we wanted to understand is the needs of emerging writers during the writing process when they interact with these uh, large language models as a creative assistants. And we also understand the opportunities and the pitfalls of language models for this task. Uh, so what we did is we designed a collaborative writing interface uh, grounded in the cognitive process model of writing, which states that uh, the goal uh, the, the writing process is a goal-oriented thinking process encompassing non-linear cognitive activities like planning, where you need to plan or you need to brainstorm ideas, translating where you verbalize the ideas or the thoughts and then reviewing where you evaluate and uh, revise. And for the language model we use at that point um, when we work, we use uh, ChatGPT. Um, so here um, is the, the framework. So at the top, you're going to see the, the writer will first uh, will um, have the opportunity. They will write a title of the story and they are going to write a plot, right? So a short plot, uh, this is written by the human and they're going to select the genre they want to work on. And then you can choose between fantasy, romance, dystopian, thriller and so on. And then they generate, um, they use the language model to generate an initial draft of the story. Uh, and this is on the top, uh, and in green here, this is the story area that can be edited by the, uh, by the writer. You all, they also had a chat interface where they can interact with the language models to refine the stories. Um, we providing them with some prompts uh, with specific uh, type of writing. So for example, elaborate uh, or rewrite with imagery or get feedback, but they were also free to write their own instructions. So what, uh, what uh, the system does here is then it takes the user uh, instruction, but also the story and all the previous interaction in the dialogue, and then use that to kind of generate and address the user instructions. So as a methodology, we use 17 emerging writers, and this, uh, these are students in the um, uh, Master of Fine Arts programs, for example, and uh, the task was to co-write short stories uh, with the help of the language model, uh, and we restricted with the time of three hours. Um, we look at a variety of genres and we also ask a post completion survey for feedback. And we look at about like 30 co written stories uh, for this task. So uh, we have several um, insights, but what I want to emphasize here is where, in which stages of the writing process does the writer seek help from the language models? Um, and on the what x axis is just the story index from the 30 stories. Um, and then we see that uh, they are looking at using the models in all the stages, planning, translation and reviewing, primarily in translation, but also sometimes in planning in blue and in the, and the reviewing process. And we also looked, for example, just this is an illustration of one of the stories uh, about how the, the human interact with the model in each of these stages. So they go, for example, from feedback to planning, then from planning to feedback to translation and so on. So you can see this, there is a non-linear process of these interactions. Um, and um, what we found out was that even if they sought this uh, help of the models from all the stages, the models were more proficient, for example, providing help in the translation phase rather than in the planning phase. Um, this is some feedback from the from the surveys. So we look at trying to understand the sense of agency that the person has when interacting with the language models. Um, and you can see that in the in the blue 
uh, it has I had complete control and in the green I played a major role. So this is almost like 40 percent in 28 percent is like the, the story was kind of equal written by the, the authors, the writer and the model. And then in the 25 um, percent of the cases is mostly written by the AI system. So people just consider it's good enough so they didn't do anything. Um, in terms of helpfulness, uh, they noticed that uh, mostly helpful and definitely helpful, it's about 25%. 50% it's somewhat, and then for 25% was like really uh, hardly helpful or not helpful at all. So the main issue we identified here was uh, repetitiveness, reliance on cliché, lack of nuance, suggestion of overly moralistic and predictable endings. And also the idea that the model, even if it generates, it really doesn't understand. And this resonates very well with a recent paper on the generative AI paradox from uh, University of Washington, what the model can create, it may not understand. So this, um, this outcome from this uh, small study led us to try to answer the questions, how can we actually evaluate creative writing? How can we design a rubric to be able to say if a piece of writing is creative or not? And with this, trying to answer more about can language models generate creative story and are they good at evaluating that? So this is a very recent paper will be presented at CHI where we try to really build and how to build this rubric to evaluate creative text. And we designed a theoretically grounding evaluation protocol for that based on cognitive science and social psychology. And we, inv uh, we involved domain experts um, in this task at various uh, stages. Um, and our evaluation reflects the limitation of using these large language models both to generate creative text as well as to evaluate it. So let me just very briefly go over and, you know, if people are interested, we, uh, this will be a paper, um, as I mentioned, presented at CHI um, in May. Um, so we started creativity um, and in the literature, if you think about creativity as a process, there are creative text, um, tests to, to be able to assess whether a creative process is creative or not. And we use the Storen test of creative thinking um, as uh, that is developed uh, by Torrance in 1966 that evaluates this process of creative uh, creativity on the four dimension, fluency, flexibility, originality and elaboration. And then when we think about creativity as a product, which is a story, um, we have this um, evaluation protocol uh, from um, from social psychology that mentioned that uh, creativity should be a collective judgment of experts in that field. And this is called the consensual assessment technique. So what we did is actually we took insights from both of these and we designed a new protocol we call Torrance's test of creative writing uh, to design 15, 14 tests that align with the about four, four dimension of creativity, fluency, flexibility, originality and elaboration. And uh, we focus on short stories. So let me tell very briefly what this Torrent test of creative writing was. So as I mentioned, we designed these 14 tests and this was the outcome of feedback from eight experts where they look at a story and try to design these tests and criteria aligning with these four dimensions, fluency, flexibility, originality and elaboration. So on fluency, we end up with um, five uh, such tests, and I'm going to read only one. Like, for example, in fluency, scene and elaborate versus exposition. Does the story display an awareness and insight into the balance between scene and summary exposition? If we look at flexibility, one of the dimension was perspective and voice flexibility. Does the story provide diverse perspectives? And if there are, uh, are unlikable characters, are their perspective presented convincingly and accurately? Originality, and then you have your originality in thought, is the story an original piece of writing without any cliches? And then elaboration, for example, rhetorical complexity, does the story operate on multi, uh, multiple levels of meaning, surface and subtext? So given this uh, test that we designed, then we wanted to say, well, uh, the second design principle was we wanted to focus, as I mentioned, on creativity as product. So we look at the story. So here what we took, uh, we did, we wanted to look at export writing. So we took a New Yorker stories um, and we take 12 of them. 
And then what we did in order to build the story generated by the models, we summarize uh, these stories using GPT-4 and then you use a human um, expert writers to uh, verify the plot if it is uh, faithful to the stories. And then we use uh, three models to generate stories uh, with, that are responsive to the plot. And we limit them to be in the same um, lengths with the original story. So we had ChatGPT, GPT-4 and Claude models at that point. And then the idea here, we want to distinguish good creative writing from uh, model or mediocre uh, writing. And we use this test that we just designed and we cluster these four stories uh, on the same plot. Um, and then the way that we use this uh, Turing test of creative writing we had is as these binary yes, no questions. And uh, we use 10 creative writing experts in this evaluation state. So these are completely independent from the experts we use to design the tests. And then we also use the language models as evaluators, right? So uh, how we actually use chain of thought prompting to prompt these models and then ask these models to evaluate the stories across all the 14 dimensions. And again, we use binary questions and this open-ended rationale as well. So the binary question is used to do a quantitative assessment and the qualitative assessment is done looking at the rationales. So the question we ask is, are language model good at generating creative text um, on all these 14 dimensions? And if you look at the look at the expert stories, you see that they are ranking very, very high. So this is the New Yorker ones. However, if you are looking at all these models, um, is really they are not doing well. And especially originality and form, they are very poor. And even if you look at the average, they are really three to ten, like you know, many, many times less um, uh, good than the expert writers. Um, we also look at whether these language models are good as evaluators of creative text. So here what we did, we used, as I mentioned, we prompted all the models to evaluate based on all of these dimensions. And we look at the correlation between the model prediction and the human expert. And we see that in most of the cases, it's either this complete disagreement or only slight agreement, which means less than 0.2 um, uh, kappa. Uh, so we see that this is really, they are really not good at evaluating creative text. Um, another uh, dimension we look at trying to figure out if the experts can distinguish between language model generated stories and professional written ones. And we can see that in all the, uh, the cases for the New Yorker stories, they, they could be uh, most of the time uh, figure out the, the expert writer that is actually written by an expert. And when we look at the models, uh, especially for GPT, so most of the time we're attributed to written by AI. Claude is actually a mix between written by AI or an amateur writer in this case. So we also ask them if there is an amateur writer. So here are some of the feedback how people could figure out whether the model was uh, whether the story was written by a mo uh, by a language model versus an expert writer. So AI rarely knew how to end the story. AI metaphors or comparison fell flat with nonsensical analogies. AI written dialogue disappointedly lacked the sub subtext. AI writing is rife with cliché, and then character could appear disappear without impact. So you see this all all these kind of. Uh, comments align with our criteria that we develop in, in our test. So the takeaways here is that um, experts seek to use these language models in all stages of creating writing, planning, translation and reviewing by find language model more helpful in translation and not so much in planning. And this led us also to design this new evaluation protocol for short narratives that shows that language models are not good at creative, uh, generating creative stories. And also, they are not yet good at assessor of quality of creative uh, text. So we shouldn't use these models um, as assessor of creativity. So I end here. This is a uh, approach like a human centric NLP across all these dimensions, knowledge enhanced model, human AI collaboration frameworks and evaluation protocols. And one of the areas we're really looking into is like how to human use this language model on specific tasks and how well do this language model perform on real um, tasks as well. So with this, I want to thank you and also all my students and postdocs, undergraduate students, master students, and all my collaborators. And I'm very happy to take questions. Well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Esmeralda. We have one question already. Uh, Mike Rosner, please uh, go ahead. 
Hi, thanks. Uh, thanks for an interesting talk. One question I wanted to ask you was this: When you were presenting the um, the um, the evaluation of creative of of help with creative writing, did you take account of the native language of the, of the writers? Yes. So they, we were actually all of the all of the people were native speaker of uh, of English. So it's all American. So we 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 look definitely we look at the background. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, any, any other, other questions? questions? An echo, yes, please, go ahead. Yeah, hello, thanks for a, a great talk. Uh, it's a pleasure to see uh, the boundaries of large language models. <laughs> and uh, so I have, it's, it's a high level question, but do you think these issues with creative writing, uh, they seem daunting, right? I, I guess uh, having larger or, uh, or larger language models or even language models which have been trained on I don't know more more kind of creative writing, so more text. I it seems difficult that they will be fixed. So, do you think that um, there's a need of uh, maybe a higher level, more abstract planning of yes. the story, the way we humans do? So, I guess we first think of the story and then we elaborate it. And uh, I don't know. Do you have any hints of which could be? Yes, absolutely. For so, I... on those higher levels. Yes, absolutely. Um, so we could see here very clearly from the how they, they they actually the writers want to use them in planning and they are really not good. So I think maybe having a planner on top, so kind of starting with the planning mechanism and then using the language models in, for example, in translation on, and feedback, I think that probably would be the way of an architectures rather than just using the language model as it. So I would see much more complex architectures where you have a planning first and then you do the, the writing at, at these stages. The models are also becoming more and more powerful. So we had actually our collaborators did a, a test of now Claude 3 that was just released by Anthropic. So it actually gets much better at this creative uh, skill. So I think the model will also improve, but they will not get there. I don't think we can just use them off the shelves of, in all of these stages. I think we would need systems that are having a planning component on top. Yes, I agree. Okay, any other questions? Uh, no? Yes, of course, uh, please go ahead. Uh, uh, I don't know the name exactly, but... I, I, I think it's me. Um, yeah, yeah. I just wanted to ask you about the torrent test that you adapted. Um, is that available to share? Um, was that intended to really evaluate the process or more the product or the person, in this case, a machine? No, so the torrent test was initially used to evaluate the creative process of people, so how people use it. And it was not really applied to the to writing at all. It would be a different type of problem solving um, that people have in different type of problem solving ideas. Um, so that was, and then they, they have these four dimensions. So what we did, we took this four dimension of flexibility, originality, um, and then ask expert writers then in the context of evaluating a story, if you're thinking about this four dimension, what are some of the criteria that you would consider being, um, you know, aligning with these four criteria? And then they, they wrote uh, with respect to some test stories, and then we uh, kind of clusters all of these um, dimensions, and then this is how we build up with the 14 test. But the, the test, the original test of creativity as a process was not applied to writing. Was yeah, that my question, I guess, the problem I, I guess I, I asked the question wrongly. The, the original torrent test that is used to test people, is this the one that you use or did you modify it for the, for, your experiment. This is what we use. Yeah, this is what we used in terms of the four main dimensions. Yes, okay. and then the and then the experts writers were trying to find what are the other like a much more finer grain dimension that aligns with these four four categories. Yes. Sure. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. Great work. Thanks. We still have time for. Uh, one or two more questions. So, no. Uh, okay, Nico. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's an elaboration of um, of the previous question, and 
So how you envision, I, I was speculating myself, how could we maybe work on how to do a higher level planning, right? So that could be completely human or it could be maybe a large language model working on a more abstract, say, or a, or, or a say more abstract, but still with text. Working a, so a language model planning, uh, say a narrative on a higher level abstraction, but still with language, of course. Or would you say in your experience that we, we could uh, use things like, uh, well, the knowledge bases and the, I don't know, maybe events, mind from text or some other structure, which uh, doesn't necessarily need to be a language model, but something, something complementary. Yes, so um, so we are actually working with someone who is looking um, in kind of program synthesis of you know, almost generating this automata type things where you're going to have some concepts of, you know, what would it mean to plan a stories and then kind of then in each of these uh, almost like a program and then you then you called you know, the language model, let's say now you having this idea in this plan, then you elaborate it. Yeah, so I would see much more higher level kind of a knowledge model or almost like a program automata that can the kind of you that you write the plan and then you then you call the model to just elaborate i would i would say yes yeah. so I, I would envision something like that so we are not there yet but absolutely i think it's not um, it, it could also be a part of the language model so there has been some work doing in generation where they actually use the language model to plan but it was just very simple things like concepts you know, and then then they mm -hmm. they generate based on that. So plan and write. I think that that's some some approaches that have been using that, but at a very like superficial level, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hi. I think you are muted. Oh, thank you very much for this very interesting work. Uh, I have more like a technical question, and sorry if it has been answered because I had an interruption. So you're using GPT-4 uh, to summarize the, the, the books. Uh, this part, like, first of all, because you probably need a license to do that or like to pay a little bit. And then of course, summarizing an entire book, I don't know how feasible is it uh, in terms of- Yeah. Uh, how, how, how much effort was that? And like, what would, if other researchers want to do that, how much, I don't know, budget or effort would they allocate for this? Right, so I want to clarify. So we look at, uh, sorry, this was not clear. This was the New Yorker story. So we look at New Yorker short stories. So it's about like, a, it, it's a much, much shorter. So it's not a book. Um, with a book, it's going to be a lot of context that you have to give it to the model more expensive. So the, I don't think quite to remember the budget, but it was not very expensive and it was only 12. So we only look at the 12 New Yorker stories for this study. And then from this, we generate, you know, the plot and the human validated this 12. And then we use the models to generate like each for each of the New Yorker story. We generate three using the three different language models. And yeah, I, I, I don't remember the monetary funds, but I don't think it was like it was in the hundreds, probably not like not super expensive, I think, for, for this stage. OK, thank you. Okay, so I, I I do have a question um, about visual metaphors. Well, visual figurative language in general. Uh, I've been following that work uh, since uh, it was published, and so um, yeah, and and there is also the explainability part. But what I'm thinking about is when you look at the data, the synthetic data you generate. I mean, some of these metaphors are very difficult to interpret. I mean, even in the example that you gave in the slides, the kind of visual, this snow and being uh, the, the earth and, you know, this kind of visual, this kind of picture uh, generated by the large language model. Sometimes uh, on the one hand, uh, to me, it looks like very difficult to interpret whether there is then an entailment or a contradiction with respect to a linguistic metaphor on the one hand, because of the the way these images are generated. So my question is, I mean, uh, which kind of results? Uh, so uh, how much the, uh, influence this issue has in the results you have in the entailment task? This is one question. 
uh, because it looks very difficult to me because of the way these images are, are generated. And then the second question in relation with this is it'll be nice actually to uh, have a data set. Perhaps there is already uh, one out there and I don't know it, but with metaphors or irony using real data, because we know that this is very popular in social media. You have an image and then you have a, a comment, which could be uh, an irony. And then you need to actually uh, be able to interpret a picture in order to interpret the meaning of the ironic uh, expression and so on. So it would be nice to, uh, instead of working with synthetic data, to have uh, such a data set, real data. Uh, Data sets. Yeah, so, so there are some there are some data sets that have some images, but not sp specifically in the metaphor. I think there was one. There were more. so in this. Um, um, so th yeah, so that would be also like one of the the tricky like when you do the uh, generation of the data versus the real data. Um, we use the New Yorker caption. Sometimes they do have metaphors as well or humor. So that's a real data set actually written by, like you know the, the images were generated by humans and that's like a, and with the with the caption so in our shared tasks that we have right now i think we have both combination both synthetic data sets and real data sets um but then the explanation we, we did it as a human ai kind of collaboration where the the explanation part of the entailment uh this was generated also using gpt4 and then there was the human correction for the explanation from the explanation so i think one of the the tricky part of course if you do and we show very uh, um that when you have the entailment between the caption and the image directly the model has a higher time uh, you know harder times but then what i would um what i think would be like useful for the model is to kind of have almost like these two stages where, you know, you have a model that gets the image and try to explain and try to describe what the image is about and using that information also as input to the model where I try to make the prediction between the intel and contradicts because then maybe, if, you know, you, you have an explanation of what the image is about and then you then you use that as an input. So we did some experiments where we look at if you have this generation of the the description of the image improved the model performance, but we're still not there yet. I think the we did some baseline now for our shared task, and I have to remember, depending on the data sets, we are still in the like, kind of 70, I would say, the max for, for some of this. Yet. Yeah, so there is a lot, I think. It's a hard ta it's a hard data set, I think, for, for the yeah, visual, is. for language and vision. Uh, to, yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay, maybe the last question, because it's already been passed. Uh, yes, go ahead, please, uh, Iria. No, no question. Uh, hi, oh, yes. can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, thank you for your great talk. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you for a great talk. I really liked it. Uh, I'm gonna ask my question first. Uh, uh, actually, two questions. The first one is kind of philosophical. Uh, we human, we are so multidimensional. We have so many values. What is good, what is bad. We have so many emotions, and most of these are not modeled in all these LMs or they have no idea what is good and bad. They have only what is uh, exactly our answer and what is not our answer in some questions. I know they can learn to some extent, but they do not feel the emotion needed for writing a story or maybe some more complex story rather than a narrative, you know. Uh, how do you think what things can be used? And the other question I'm going to take even faster. Uh, I'm a master's student. I'm about to choose my topic uh, for thesis. And, and I was wondering how much computation is needed for all these because even except especially for the visual things, I'm actually so overwhelmed by this field and at the same time I love it. Thank you. Yeah, so yeah, so to answer the first part, uh, of course, I think right now that's one of the biggest challenge and there are work right now that are trying to empower and I think this will kind of go along with my, the, my, my first part of like how could, can you use knowledge to combine the power of the language models with this kind of knowledge models that and this knowledge can incorporate, for example, user preference or user values. We are working now uh, on a different topic on, for example, how can we uh, empower these models to use knowledge of social cultural norms to do better dialogues uh, that take into account if you have people from different culture, what are their norm of conversation, not to be, to be able to help the model not derail the conversation because you don't understand the... So we are working on that. We are still far from solving these problems, but this is kind of the idea of how can you, um, to augment this large language model or 
the language model with knowledge from that can actually or incorporate various aspects, including norms and values. Um, and then the other part of the computational, yes, uh, that's why I think one of the emphases I mentioned. So one of the work we actually having, and I think in academia in general, we have these problems. And if you are a good small university or large university, you still have issues with uh, compute and uh, sources. So that's why I think a lot of time what we are doing is we're using these large language models to generate or annotate data sets, smaller, like you know, some data sets, and then we are basically building these smaller models. So using the smaller model that don't require, we don't need to run, you know, GPT or any other very, very large language models to solve it. So I think the idea would be to kind of get a better data sets where you can actually build smaller model to solve the task. So yeah, yeah, we are all working. We are all pained by the, the issue of compute. <laughs> okay. okay, so, okay. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thanks. So, so there is a question in the chat. As I understood, large language models are applicable for writing. Is there any way to apply these models on a speech? Yeah, I, I think there is a lot of work in speech, and I think a lot of this, um, um, like, so the, there is uh, the, all this idea of the transformer and powerful models. I think there are, um, I don't work specifically on speech to say which one are the best ones, but there is a lot of work on, on in the speech um, uh, using this idea of the, Kind of the large model, foundational model on the speech. Yes. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not work, so I'm, I. I. I don't. I don't know, and I don't want to say something wrong. But uh, we do have at Columbia work and, and speech, and they are using these models, uh, not for like you know creative aspects, uh, but I think in general in speech. And of course, they are not super perfect, and there is very hard problem. Um, you know, in applying these models for different languages, and we have the same issue on text as well. So. Okay, so yeah, I think we are a little bit over time. So thanks again for this great presentation. I think it was uh, very enjoyable. So yeah, thanks Thank you, for, uh, like I said, accepting an invitation. And yeah, so and thank you everybody for attending. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was, it was really great uh, to be here. So happy to also share if you interested. I'm happy to share slides and everything. So. Ah, thank you. That's really nice. Yeah, I, we may we may ask. Uh, uh, well, we, we'll talk later about this this issue. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Okay, Bye. Thank everyone. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.